I grew up in a ministry home. We were a part of great Baptist churches growing up and was familiar with how the Annie Armstrong offering was put to such incredible use. But growing up in Alabama, it's kind of scary to think that we were gonna come out here to try something that we had not done before, that we knew the Lord was calling us to, but didn't wanna do it alone. The context here in Las Vegas is much different than the context in Alabama, and one of that is just religious awareness. 60% of our city would identify with no religion at all. And because of that, I think we have a unique opportunity to introduce them to who Jesus is. It really makes me think of Maki's story. I met Maki for the first time. He showed up at one of our events before we launched called an invite night. My name is Maki Pizzolo. I'm a professional MMA fighter, which is a professional mixed martial arts fighter. Um, I never thought that God would love a person that fights and looks towards violence for a living. But before Favorite City Church started, Joseph led me to Christ. And I would say that today, my life is blessed. I couldn't even put it into words. My guy is blessing me left and right, bro. Yeah, that's, that's legit. I didn't even know church planting was a thing until I met them, but, um, and I'm looking forward to be able to go out and help make more disciples and really turning the tides in people's lives. Yeah, so now we're in a space where we're seeing over 150 people engaging at our church. We've seen over 30 professions of faith. So the freedom that we get from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is that we get to engage with people like my friend, Maki. We get to take our time and then that's where we're able to see the disciple making process happen and the church be born. Those that are serving the interest of Southern Baptist Convention and kingdom ministry all around the world, especially across North America. With that said, you have the opportunity to be invested in that. Our campus-wide goal is $750. We are 120 towards that goal at this point. So thank you to those who've already given, and uh, we encourage you to be prayerful about what you can give during this special missions offering season. Uh, we're also grateful today to have friends of Clear Creek with us. If you're from Faith Baptist Church with Brother Benny Bush, would you stand up for just a moment? And uh, these fine folks here come down from Corbin, Kentucky today. <laughs> awesome church, and I know several of us have had the privilege to preach there for Brother Benny, and so we love, uh, love this family and this family of faith and just pray uh, for them. Um, with that said, I'm going to ask Curtis uh, to come forward. We are in uh, the next three days today, tomorrow at 11 and Thursday. This is student-led revival here in the spring uh, semester. And so three of our students have had the opportunity, or our classes have had the opportunity to extend invitations for speakers to come and to lead us uh, in the student-led revival. So Brother Curtis today uh, has extended the invitation to our first guest uh, preacher. And uh, Brother Curtis doesn't look the part for chapel today because he's been digging ditches this morning uh, doing his job here on campus and so uh, but I told him that'd be perfectly fine so you come on brother Curtis and introduce our speaker today good morning Clear Creek good morning. Hey, that was actually pretty good so it's my honor and privilege to introduce today's chapel speaker for our revival, Dr. John Franklin, and he's been a huge impact upon my life as a Christian. He's married to Kathy, has three children, and he has, has the position of director of missions over in Christian County, and he's been there for about two years, coming up on two years now. But Dr. John has been have a huge impact on me because I came from Pennsylvania, and I was just a brand new Christian. I grew up in church all my life, and I found out it's not all about the rules, it's having a relationship with God. And so whenever I moved down here, I had no direction, no sense of guidance or anything. And Dr. John was the interim at a, at a church that I went to, and he was able to walk alongside me and help me grow and be able to become the Christian that I am working at today. And so he has kept in contact with me all these years and watched me and my wife grow and grow spiritually and see how my life has been developing. And so he's been a blessing in every way, shape, and form. And so I hope that as much of a blessing as he's been to me, that he will be to everyone that is able to take and listen to the message that has today. And so with that, 
Dr. John Franklin for our very first revival speaker. Can I ask that we all bow our heads in a word of prayer? Dear Lord, we come here before you today with our heads bowed low, asking for our hearts and our minds to be able to be placed in a position to be able to receive your word. Lord, we can never make revival happen. Only you can make revival happen. And so, Lord, we ask this time for our hearts and our minds to be focused on you. And as the worship team takes this time to lead us in what truly matters of our purpose in this life, which is to glorify you through praise and adoration. So let this time be a blessing to all of us and help us all grow closer to you as we be able to be that light to the world of darkness around us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we open our chapel, Student Later Revival Chapel, I invite you to stand, and as you're standing, I want to read two verses of scripture that comes very familiar to us from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Christ is our light, and we are here to worship him this morning, and we are thankful that he stepped out into darkness. And he has given us his marvelous light as we sing. Yeah. 
clap of praise this morning. Let's go before the throne of grace this morning. 
petitioning our needs, petitioning the next three services as we've set it aside to be a student-led revival. The word revival, may you revive us again as we have a time of prayer. that you're in our midst. And may over the next 72 hours, may you do a work in our lives. And God, may it begin in me. May you break the chains of sin. Death so easily beset us. And may we leave here changed be ready to go out into the world to shine the light in the darkness. God, we love you and we thank you. in your grace that we don't deserve. Sing with me. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost
next door. The sun forbear to shine. sing that chorus again. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. you we thank you for your amazing grace that saved a wretch like me god we thank you that you have set our chains free that you've broken those chains that get in our ways and god may we right now prepare our hearts to receive the word may we leave here challenged May we leave here revived, and may we leave here ready to serve. Bless the preacher right now. Open his mouth, speak through him what only you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, thank you so much, and it is a great privilege to be here with you at this inaugural address on revival. I'm so grateful because I've heard a clear creek in your reputation and the way that God has used you both in the faculty and the students and over the process of time since 1926, and it is an incredible, incredible privilege uh, to, to me. And I'm glad that y'all are sitting down front too. Because if you've ever preached, you know how bad it is when somebody runs off to the back and you're down here preaching to a bunch of empty seats. So that helps me, and I thank you for that as well. And <clears throat> here we are for a spring revival. Now, what is a revival. Well, if we're going to have one, we need to make sure we are clear on what it is we're asking God for, should we not? And a revival <coughs> can take at least three different expressions. In the first one, we can find it in Psalm 119, 107. And in that psalm, it has the word revive more than any other chapter in the Bible that I'm aware of. And the writer of this psalm says, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. So in this particular case, this individual is afflicted. He is in difficulty and trial. There is some deprivation or external uh, influence upon him, and he is asking for sustenance, strength, or maybe a renewing. And maybe some of you are here today and you're saying, that's exactly what I need. I need a personal reviving from the Lord. I need a touch from Him to re-energize me, to sustain me, to give me, as it were, fresh oil. <clears throat> so a revival can be an energizing of what is needed in your soul. But a second thing it can be is a renewal or return of the Lord's working among His people. And I want to go to a very poignant cry to God from Psalm 90. It is the prayer of Moses, the man of God. But we will be not reading the 
chapter in its entirety, but we will get our focal verses beginning at verse 13. And I want you to hear Moses cry out to God. He said, Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. Oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. And then listen to this. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Okay, why in the world, out of all the record that we have of Moses, and there's one inclusion there over in the book of Psalms, maybe he's got another couple of Psalms in the other books that he wrote, but why the record of this? And why is it that he's asking God to return once again? Why is he asking God to let his work appear to his servants and his glory to their children? Well, let me tell you why. So many times we read this stuff and we don't think of context, but if you were Moses and you were in the wilderness, what would you have been particularly cognizant of in your experience You see, if you go over to chapter 3 of Exodus where Moses first encounters the Lord and you got 40 chapters total of Exodus, that gives you 38 chapters of that. And then you go over and you do all of Leviticus and that's 27 chapters. And then you go to the first 14 chapters of Numbers and you add them up, that's 79 chapters. And God in the span of less than two years is doing incredible, incredible things. He's doing ten plagues and Red Sea splitting and Mount Sinai and water out of the rock, manna being provided. But in chapter 14 of Numbers, they refused to go into the promised land. And God said, for 40 years I was angry with that generation. So I swore in my wrath they shall never enter my rest. And then you watch what happens And if we had the Bible and if we could give you the the thickness of how many pages you're reading in all of those books I just told you, and then we were to talk about how much does God do over the next 37 years, it'd be about that much. You just get five chapters out of Numbers before they start again toward the promised land in chapter 20 of Numbers. It's as if God quit working, he gave a few laws, and he killed some people in those five chapters. He basically did nothing. For 37 years. At least I think that's what it is. We don't know exactly when it is, but I believe this is when this is put in there. But whatever the case, he is crying out that God would return because God is no longer visible and present. Hey, would you like for God to do a returning work here in this nation and in this church? You do know that he's done that in the past. Why, if we could survey, and if you're aware of the First Great Awakening when Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield began to preach and God impacted the colonies, perhaps one in ten were alcoholics in that day, and God so radically turned us back to himself and prepared us for our revolutionary war and our independence of our nation. But then, having gained that victory and, and everything going well, and the fact that the average lifespan... In 1800, in America, was 37 years of age, many, many deaths of children and others. It didn't take long for people to forget what God had done. And so by 1800, there were only five professing Christians found among the entire student body of Harvard and Princeton, which were founded as seminaries. Did you know that? That's how they were founded originally, before what they became. (coughs) And yet suddenly, God out in the middle of nowhere on the frontier of western Kentucky, not far from where I live currently, sent a man named James McGreedy, who had been run out of his uh, church with death threats in North Carolina, but nonetheless intimidated, came to the lawless frontier of western Kentucky that was nicknamed Rogue's Harbor. Because if you committed a crime in the east, and if you could but cross the Appalachian Mountains and make it over there, there was absolutely no law in order. It was the wild, wild west in 1800. In fact, it was said that 
that uh, no woman could could go outside without her feminine sensibilities being offended. Isn't that a cool way to, to express that kind of thing? <coughs> but they began to call for prayer time. And they did that at, at sundown on Saturdays and sunrise on Sundays. And there on the Red River in, in Logan County, Kentucky, <coughs> they had a week-long service of the Lord's Prayer. And God showed up and came down and now understand that the whole county of Logan at that time went from where it is today, which is a west of Bowling Green, if, and all the way to, the, to, to Kentucky's uh, rivers and all of that, and all the way to the north of the Ohio. And there are only about 5,000 people there. And yet God came down in such a mighty way that Barton Stone in Paris, which is east of Lexington, 40 miles, heard about it, went and witnessed it witnessed that and went back to his large population center for Kentucky then, right outside Lexington, and organized it there, <coughs> and perhaps 25,000 people came there. That was at least a tenth of the state. Could you imagine that? And God came down, and that movement leapt across. It went out of Kentucky and went across the Appalachian Mountains to the entirety of the eastern seaboard and transformed the nation in one of the greatest movements of God in our history. And God revived his work. But then again, that waned. And so when you come pre-Civil War, our country is again drifting from the things of God. But Jeremiah Lanfear, a Dutch Reformed, Dutch Reformed layman in New York City, called for a noontime prayer meeting on Wednesdays, September 23rd, <coughs> from 12 to 1. He put out bills and flyers not knowing what to expect. And the first prayer meeting, nobody showed up except six. And they were 30 minutes late. Hey, if y'all go out to lead prayer meetings in your church that's not well attended, don't be discouraged. It's been going on a while. <clears throat> but my house shall be a house of prayer. However, the Lord met them. And the next time they met, about 20 showed up. And they had a good time in the Lord. Then it doubled the next week. And about that time, Wall Street crashed. And suddenly, that catalytic moment arrested the entire attention of all New Yorkers. And God descended and there were as many as perhaps 50,000 businessmen praying every single day in New York City for a season. And that movement left out of New York City. It went to the entirety of the U.S. And it prepared us for the dreadful ordeal of the Civil War. And during that 12 to 24 month time of 57 to 58, 59, about 1 million were saved out of a population of 30 million, and that continued all throughout the Civil War, and God turned the nation back to himself again. But he has not done that since then at the national level of that size. There have been touches from God. There were the Azusa Street Revival, and there was a Jesus movement. But what if God were to come? Have you been hungry? Perhaps you've heard of his stirrings recently, particularly in those, the majority of you who are students' generation. You, perhaps you have heard of Asbury and what God did a mere 13 months ago in that college location in which he came down, and for 16 days there was never a time for 24 hours that they were not gathered in their chapel, Hughes Auditorium, singing and praising God, in which Tens of thousands of people, even from around the world, came to participate and to hear what God did. And perhaps you heard how <clears throat> out of Asbury, other college campuses were touched. Perhaps you heard of the 1500 meeting on, at Baylor at that time. Did you hear about what happened at Auburn last fall when <clears throat> one of the speakers, uh, a college minister, went there expecting one to 200 because... This was a six-week organized student event, and 6,500 students showed up. And after he preached, one student came up and said, Oh, that is so good. I, I, I want to I give my life to Jesus Christ right now. Can I be baptized tonight? He said, Well, do you know what baptism is? So they talked about that, and the guy said, Yes, that's what I want to do. They said, Well, where's water? They said, Well, near the, the, the big red barn, everybody on campus knows where that is, there's a lake. We could all migrate over there and meet and, and get baptized. Okay, let's do it. Another, another student said, well, I want to get baptized. And, well, do you know what baptism is? And they went through that. They ended up going over there, and before it was over with, over 200 students were baptized that night. 
I have a six-week promoted event. Do you know what happened in Florida State recently? Florida State, I don't know who does these kind of statistics, but they are considered the number two party school in the United States. And yet, when they held a Christian event there, there were 314 students who professed Jesus Christ. God is doing something. He is stirring right now. When you are here for student-led revival, are you looking for God to return and revive his work and to show his glory to your generation and to your campus? Well, finally, a revival can be a rediscovery of what was lost. Like Josiah's day when they found the book of the law. Or it can be a discovery of a new work that God is initiating or a new direction that he's going, such as on the day of Pentecost. And when he does something new, which is what I want to highlight here, here's a characteristic of that from Acts 2.17. Acts 2.17 is Peter's preaching this sermon to interpret what all these events mean. He's quoting out of the book of Joel. And it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. You know that see vision, dream dreams? I think that's same, the same idea with just a couple of different sets of word, but it's communicating the same, same idea. If you're looking for revival, could it be God might meet you here in a fresh way and set your life in a brand new direction? Could that even happen over these next three days? Well, I don't know what that could be, but here's a for instance. You do know that the gospel must first be preached to all the nations and then the end will come? What does that mean? Well, all the nations... Is the, is the Greek word ethnoi or ethnos in its dictionary form. <clears throat> and then we get the word ethnic from that. An ethnic group is someone who has a shared culture and language. And so he's not saying the gospel must first be preached to China and America and Russia. It's not geopolitical boundaries that he's talking about. He's talking about the people groups inside of those nations. The Apache, Comanche, the Hutu, the Hmong, the Karamajong, all of these groups. And one of the great places God is working right now, in fact, he's working all over the world. The gospel is advancing every place in the world except four. Would you like to know where they are? Well, Europe, North America, Australia, Japan, but everywhere else, the gospel is exploding. The gospel, now it may be growing the fastest in Iran of any place right now. If that's not true, it's certainly exploding there. India is absolutely off the, the, the chart right now. I know this one missions organization started 12 years ago and now has more missionaries than the Southern Baptist Convention, and they're planting uh, on a poor month 300 house churches every month. Those numbers sounded too fancy. They're, they're planting 800 last year. In the first three months of the year, I remember that. Those numbers sounded too fantastical. So one of their biggest donors decided to privately vet them behind their back and went around and found out it was true. <clears throat> what if God were calling you to go reach every tribe, language, tongue, and people? They're all going to be around the throne, and that, that, that people is the ethnic. It's, the, it, it, it's who I'm talking about. And did you know that the little country of India, I don't mean population, I mean size, it's about 40% of the United States, geographically speaking, maybe 45%. Did you know it has more unreached people groups that have never heard the gospel than the entire continent of Africa? What if God called you? What are you looking for? But could it be he wants to do all three? It's a funny thing when God's spirit shows up, sometimes he does all three. Listen, I was at Baylor two weeks ago, actually a little less than that even, and the event was a round table, it was a revival round table. It was a discussion on what is it that God is doing right now, and the particular focus was Gen Z, which if you're a student, I'm assuming the majority of you are, and that's up to about age 24, 25. 
and what is God doing? And what was shared there gripped me. And I want to tell you some of the things that they were saying God is particularly doing in your generation. And if you fit that, I want you to tell me if that's accurate. And if you don't and you, you are watching that generation, tell me if you think this is accurate. So the first thing, and, and again, I need to actually tell you this before I forget it. There were about 100 people gathered and it was multi-generational. So it has some real old guys who were in the Jesus mo movement. It had guys like me who, well, I'm not young anymore, but then again, I'm not that old either. And then it had all the way down to Gen Zers who were present as well. And so it had a rich context when we gathered and questions were facilitated. So here's the first thing right here. When they talked about one of the defining characteristics of Gen Z, they surfaced the word fatherlessness. That means that so many of the young generation have grown up without a father in the home. And that is physically, literally true. And many times that is spiritually or emotionally true. And God made gender, right? He made male and female. He made father and mother. And each one have certain unique roles that they fulfill. And one of the impacts the father has is that of the protector and the provider and that of the providing that security. And there is a sense, in fact, I watched this as this was surfaced. I thought to myself, they're up there on the panel discussing this, and I turned around, I looked in the audience at all the Gen Z, about 15 people who were there, and they're over there nodding. Later on, we broke into prayer times, and I prayed with a beautiful young woman, and she talked about how she had grown up and never had a daddy in her household. And we got to pray, and I prayed over her that God would bless her, and he would sustain her and strengthen her. And it was not lost on me that I, being a man, was asking for a favor upon her from God that she had never known growing up. And she just began to weep uncontrollably, just tears. And it may be also that I was weeping as well. <clears throat> One of the things that they shared at, at Asbury, <clears throat> there were several things they talked about this revival that just stuck with me that resonated. And they talked about that when, when, when God came and he began to move and, and they opened times that, that, they, that, that people were invited to the altar. And, 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 and Dave Thomas, who, who was over at the, uh, the, he's on the faculty at, at, there's Asbury College, Asbury Seminary. Dave, Dave Thomas, not the Wendy's founder. Dave Thomas was over there at, at the Asbury Sem Seminary site, and he was kind of behind the scenes helping uh, shepherd that. And he said, if we could have visibly seen what was spiritually happening, he said, the number one thing that I saw happen was that people were getting set free. You would have seen sh sh uh, uh, shackles and fetters and chains strewn all over the altar. He said, let me tell you another way that it happened. He said, we have a counseling center there. And the counseling center was so busy that we had five times more requests from students for counseling than we had students applying for admissions on the college. And, and he said, uh, it was so overloaded and the counselors that if a student called the first question they would ask is are you suicidal and if they weren't the earliest they could get them in was three weeks out he said but when revival came 16 days later the counseling center called up and said hey uh, we got a bunch of uh, counselors with nothing to do do you know anybody who needs any counseling y'all jesus was just setting people free of pornography and addictions and then of many hurts in the past of brokenness and the chains and what it was like to have been abandoned or left alone or have felt that way what if God came and did that and the question is you do know that when revival comes it always starts in the young generation the things I'm talking to you about it never starts in generation my age now you always need mature godly spiritual leadership when he comes because of the young generation will go off the rails if they don't have that but it still remains that historically God has always come to the young generation and so might he come to you here's the second thing they said about your generation tell me if this is true 
They said, you are looking for authenticity. They said, you are incredibly hungry, and you're passionate, and you're missional, but what you particularly hate are things that are fake and unreal, and you really don't care about the slickness or the polish or how pretty it is or how well done it is if it's not real. What you want to know is, is it real? And that's what you particularly respond to. One of the campus ministers said, <clears throat> you know, I just canceled the retreats because they're not asking what's the event or who's the speaker. They're asking who is going to be there, meaning my friends, and I want to encounter Jesus with them. He said, do you know in my church, now again, he's at, at Waco where Baylor is. He said, uh, I have 80 to 100 college young men every Sunday morning meet at 8 a.m. to pray. And there's nothing slick and there's no production or anything like that. That so greatly encouraged me. Here's the last thing they said about your generation that gripped my attention. They said, you are not deliberately or intentionally, but you are kind of practicing what he called lingering. And lingering means... <coughs> that you don't care about a one-hour service. You don't want to try to put God and script him and program him, him to come in a certain time frame, but you're looking to encounter God in reality. And at Asbury, that's what happened. Look, they had a speaker come in just like me, a chapel speaker. <clears throat> Everything went wrong for that poor guy. His flight was delayed. Things didn't go right. He got in late at midnight. He was tired. He didn't have time to prepare like he wanted to. And he got up and gave a message, which I listened to, and it was kind of, it was okay. It wasn't anything bad, but, you know, then again, it wasn't anything like, wow. But after it was over, he gave the invitation, students came down. And do you know that as they lingered in the presence of God, God began to show up. And as he began to show up, some other students began to come back, and somehow others found out. And by 2 o'clock, one professor will say, one of these students bust through our classroom in the middle of my lecture, interrupted me, and, and said, Professor, whatever his name was, you've got to come to Hughes Chapel. God's come down. But I, I hope he uses your generation to get rid of our little God in a box when I were programmed. You do know that that's a Western sieve kind of a thing we morphed into and around the world where God's moving. They don't really care. They don't put God on the clock. They don't tell him when he comes. And Dave Thomas said this, we've been asking the question, how is Gen Z, or excuse me, how is the church going to reach Gen Z? It may be Jesus is asking the question, how am I going to use Gen Z to reach the church? And I hope God uses your generation to do that. So what if you sought God for this very thing in your student-led revival? What if you were not satisfied with less than or normal or natural but you're saying god we want you to come and we want i want to encounter you in a way that i have never ever ever known you what if god granted you that through you he would turn this generation around what if all the fatherlessness and the 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 authenticity and the the, the what if all of that God wanted to do through your generation and use you in the process. What if he granted the church to be revived so there would be joy and fellowship and wholeness? What if the Lord used you to set people free from what ensnares them, from the past hurts from which you're not still healed, from which your friends aren't still healed? What about from the besetting sins that still have the grip on so many people? I'll close this with this, this final story. <clears throat> Dave Thomas talked about, here's what they did. When God came down, <clears throat> he said they determined it's going to be student-led. We're not going to get others on the platform. It's, it's this generation God's going to work in, but we're going to make sure it's shepherded well. And so after two days, all of the worship leaders were exhausted, as you can well imagine. So they determine, what do we do? Well, we will now make, make it open that any group who wants to come and lead worship can do that. <clears throat> However, we want to make sure they're spiritually prepared. So instead of having a green room, they had a consecration room. 
and nobody could go on stage that did not spend a minimum of two hours getting their heart right and prepared before the Lord. He said, so we opened it up that way, and that process began, and he said, what ended up happening basically is we sang 12 songs for 16 days. He said, and I just want to tell you from a musical standpoint of quality, some of it was, well, it was just awful. It was really bad. He said, but God didn't seem to care. He said, and in that consecration room, he said, y'all, there were some things going on, confessions of sin. It was raw. It was pretty bad. In fact, he said, I remember one time, one student who was going to worship later on that day even said, Lord, I, please forgive me for looking at porn even this morning. You know, he said, but somehow, despite all of that, God showed up. And it was almost as if he was attracted to purity more than he was to polish. And when people got real and transparent and they confessed their sins and they got right with God, God was drawn to that. He said people were getting saved and there wasn't even a gospel invitation. The presence of God was so great. He said one time I saw this, this, Hindu, this, this lady down there at the altar. And when she looked up, she said, I'm, I'm from India, and I'm Hindu, but I've met him, and he's beautiful. <laughs> Dave said, yes. Uh, excuse me, let me, let me. Dave said, yes, would you like to know him? Is there anything you'd like to repent of? She said, everything. That's how strong God's presence was when people got transparent and real and they wanted him and his glory more than anything else. So as you start student-led revival, that's what I would like to invite you to pursue and to consider. Let me ask the, the worship leaders, if you would, to come up here and just sing. Unless you want to come down here to the altar and kneel because I'm going to ask Anybody who wants to can come and kneel and do business with God and whatever he's spoken to you to say, yes, Lord, I will respond and obey to you. So right now, <coughs> let's stand. If God is speaking and you want to come forward and kneel, whether it's to get something right with him, whether it's to consecrate something to him, whether it's to release something to him, whether he's put something on your heart, you come.
invite those who are praying to continue as long as the Lord leads you. I know the chapel will be open afterwards if you just want to stay in his presence. Isn't God good? May he come down in glorious ways. I want to go ahead and just say that we are dismissed unless there's something I'm missing on the program. But those who are praying, if you want to, continue. And if you want to come join them, you can do that as well. So God bless you.